I want to invite to the stage uh, Senator David Frock, Senator John Braun, Representative Jake Fay, and Representative JT Wilcox. Let's give them a round of applause to bring them on up. <laughs> Senator Frock, let me ask you first, uh, what do you think is going to happen in the 60 days that we are going to call the 2020 legislative session? What are your personal aspirations or, or thoughts there, and what do you think the caucus would like to achieve heading into the session? Thank you. Uh, DJ, thanks for having me. Um, it's great to, to be here, and um, appreciate the, the chance to talk to see so many people. I've already just was here for an hour. I've already seen so many people. I think the, the session, um, I think the first thing I would say is that um, we will get done, I, I, we anticipate getting done on time as we have the last two, the last two sessions. And um, I'm proud of the fact that as the Senate turned over in 2018 and the Democrats took control of the Senate, we were able to do a lot of things, a whole lot of things, a lot of things on the agenda that we'd had um, that had been built up over a long period of time. Uh, we were able to accomplish a lot of those ends. And I think this year, um, given that we had a large budget year last year, um, and uh, there was a lot of things that, uh, uh, a lot of in, in important policy, healthcare-wise, uh, some important things on the environment, obviously, with a lot of things related to clean energy, a lot of big policy bills. I would anticipate this year being a little bit, a little bit, um, I don't want to say slower, there'll be important uh, measures, but it'll be a little more, more tame. I would say a couple things in particular, obviously, and I'll let uh, Chairman Fai talk about the transportation situation, we're going to have to deal with 976. And I think, uh, again, I think we'll continue to find um, uh, health care being an important issue. I think there'll be some important issues related to transparency in the way that health care is delivered with uh, benefit manager legislation and other things like that that we're looking at. So I think health care and uh, those kinds of uh, issues will be very important for us. Senator Braun, let me ask you, one of the things that we see at our national politics is a legislative majority or a congressional majority will develop a vision and enact some legislation and then the, the loyal opposition will just oppose it for as long as the loyal opposition is in opposition. I don't get that sense about really any of the big legislation that passed in, in 2019. Do you feel like that's the direction we're heading in our politics, particularly and specifically to 2020, but also moving forward? Uh, you know, is there a sort of a starry decesis if, if something has been passed, it should stay or uh, stay policy? Or do you think that we're going to fight the fights of 2019 moving forward into 2020 and, and the years beyond? Well, I think, um, well, first of all, I, I just remind that, you know, the vast majority of the legislation that passes out of both chambers passes out uh, broadly bipartisan. So, so there's a, only a relatively small group of bills that are typically very controversial. They get argued about. I'd also highlight, you know, a couple big areas where uh, there has been bipartisan work, mental health in particular, uh, in this last session, had I think a very robust and bipartisan plan that, that I think still has to be executed on uh, to be successful, but, but is bipartisan. So I don't think there, you know, you're not, I, I don't, uh, that said, we, we have certainly had a lot of, uh, you know, that small group is very, you know, of, of controversial bills is very, is very challenging. There's a, a, a strong difference of opinion, particularly when it comes to, to taxation and how we ought to do that in the state. Um, and I don't expect that is likely to change. What I would like to see, what I hope for, is that, not that we don't, all, we all of a sudden, you know, agree. I don't think that's our job. We don't show up there to agree. You know, the citizens of the state of Washington don't agree on everything, and our job is to represent them. Uh, but that we try to find uh, a path forward that includes all of Washington, that really thinks of what's the best policy, uh, not just for you know, the central Puget Sound or not just best for eastern Washington or southwest Washington, but, but something that, that strikes a balance and works for all of Washington. If we're going to get through this and be successful as a state, we've got to find that, those types of solutions to our very complicated issues. If you think about the things we face, whether it's housing or, or you know, whatever you think on tax policy or homelessness or, or transportation, we, we have to find, we have to be looking for ways that bring all parts of Washington into the, in, into the discussion in a productive way. Yeah. Representative Wilcox, I'm going to uh, ask you to sort of speak to that a little bit. Some members, some folks in, in our policy and advocacy community would like to 
highlight the differences between rural and urban that played out a little bit in this year's 2019 election. Uh, as you know, as, as the leader of the House Republicans, how do you see that question of one Washington versus multiple Washingtons with multiple cultures, multiple economies, and multiple interests? How do you sort of lead and navigate your caucus through that kind of nuanced question? Well, that's, uh, I think, a question that's consumed me in my time in the legislature. Uh, and, and I feel like I've got, uh, I'm, I'm deeply rural. I'm uh, the fourth generation to live uh, on the farm that uh, I live on up the Nisqually River. But at the same time, my business has been all about uh, selling products uh, that are value added uh, in the most urban parts of the Western United States. And so uh, I, I've had to deal with that in my private life as well as my political life. And, um, you know, there, there clearly is animosity. Uh, and I think that the animosity is often uh, very counterproductive. And I've been saying publicly for a while that I'm done with, uh, with talking about the war uh, between uh, rural and urban. Uh, there are people that try to promote that. Uh, I don't think that it uh, serves the citizens of Washington very well. And uh, in terms of politics and policy, um, because uh, democracy is about counting votes, it's one that the rural parts of the state are gonna lose uh, if uh, they decide that uh, they just wanna have this constant conflict. So I think the real, uh, one of the fundamental challenges across the United States actually, because the parties are so split between rural and uh, urban, is to figure out how can you find as much common ground as you possibly can, and where you don't have common ground, have some you know, first understanding of the point of view of the uh, other side, and then some grace for the other side, because they've got their own legitimate reasons for having these divergent opinions. And I'm sorry, this is you know very philosophical rather than uh, you know, fact-based, uh, but I feel like the problems that we face a lot of times now, they all get cast in terms of policy, but the bigger problems are about trust and understanding. And uh, I feel like one of the things that we should be doing in the Washington State Legislature is putting trust first. So Mr. Chairman, for all of our opinions, uh, you're one of us that has to actually do some real heavy lifting and put your, uh, you know, your, your best foot forward as leader of the uh, Transportation Committee. Uh, give us sort of, tell us about the whirlwind that you've been in between 976 passing and then the court challenge. And it seems like even if 976 is not allowed to stand, uh, this seems like a, uh, a wake up call for how Washingtonians care to fund some of their their transportation projects. Tell us what the last sort of four or five weeks has been like for you as chair of the House Transportation Committee. Uh, well, after going through at least a couple of stages of grief, uh, I think that the, the conclusion I came to is, is that it's, I need to be thoughtful about, about um, the future. And I want to go back and talk about uh, the accomplishments that were made during the last legislative session on a bipartisan basis. Our, our budget uh, continues to be a bipartisan budget. Um, and I quite frankly, um, uh, it, the old adage that there's in the House there's two caucuses and in the Senate there's 49 free agents is it, when we get to the point of negotiating budgets, for instance, it usually is uh, with my uh, very good um, uh, ranking member, uh, Representative Barkas, who we're, we're both new to this budget process uh, this session. Um, it, is, it is making sure that our members' interests and the state's interests are taken care of. So we pass uh, legislation that moves forward, uh, the construction of um, ferries that are badly needed in the, uh, to serve those populations that are very dependent upon uh, the ferry system. And we move forward on a difficult bill, but we move forward on uh, getting tolling authorized for a number of projects in Western Washington. Um, it wasn't, 
without its disagreements, but we got through that. And so um, I think my ch biggest challenge right now is to, is to set things up for the future. Uh, because we have, everybody knows about the population increase in the state of Washington. Everybody hopefully knows that we have an injunction court case out there that needs to be resolved and, ex and increased revenues needed to address um, culverts, particularly in western Washington. And um, for our friends in southwest Washington, they have a bridge that's failing that needs to get replaced. So um, my goal uh, going forward is to try to get through this period of time uh, that we're in doubt about what the outcome of the initiative is going to be and do as little harm to the overall transportation system um, as possible. We will produce a budget. The governor will give us a budget in a couple of weeks that will reflect about $500 million in budget cuts in the transportation budget. And between the House and Senate, we've got to come to a resolution of what that's going to be in terms of where those cuts are going to come from. Um, and there's going to be a lot of uh, concern about delaying the forward movement that we've had um, over the years. But um, my job, I think, is to, is to look to the longer range and to make sure that we're not losing sight of what our needs are, how our economy is so dependent upon a great infrastructure for transportation. Um, and to continue to work on a bipartisan basis um, to make sure uh, that we are considering, as I said earlier, the interests within each legislative district across the state, but also the state as a whole and having a, a viable transportation system. So what do you say, Mr. Chairman, to those uh, advocates or maybe members of your caucus that suggest, hey, if we have to make cuts, we should cut those places that have voted against transportation funding or who have expressed that they, have, don't, uh, they didn't agree with uh, the local funding options that I-76 repealed, that we should allocate transportation dollars to those communities where transportation dollars come from. How do you respond to those advocates? Well, uh, my first response is, uh, so for instance, there is I think $63 million in the transportation and the multimodal account that's going to have, have to have close to a um, substantial two-thirds cut. Um, there's special needs transportation. And, it, and it, to me, it shouldn't matter whether um, the individual who needs that ride to the dialysis appointment resides in Yelm or Centralia or Seattle. That person has a need that needs to be met. And so we have to, do, we have to take a look at those things in a, in a, in a global context. Um, I said this is a bar bipartisan effort. We, we got a transportation package on it 20, in 2015 as a bipartisan effort. I am not interested in, in eroding the relationships that got us there because we're going to need another transportation package, um, if not in 2020 and 2021, that's going to address, as I indicated, the Columbia River crossing and culverts and other transportation needs throughout the state. So to get into punishing people over what, how they voted, I don't think is, is going to be productive and it's not going to be advancing um, the interests of the state. And, and I think the responsibility I have is to try to temper those kinds of interests, um, but also make the best kind of investments that we can still make. Sure. Senator Frock, did you want to jump well, in? You know, I, I agree. I don't think punishment is the right word. I think we should, I've always avoided that in my, <clears throat> my politics. I, I feel like we have an obligation to try to work together for the benefit of the whole state. Having said that, <clears throat> in my view, the, the fact is that in certain uh, areas, certainly in Seattle, which I represent, and Lake Forest Park, I represent Seattle, Lake Forest Park, Kenmore, so a major city and then two smaller suburban cities, the, the local cuts or the way that the initiative was structured is so devastating to the transportation budgets that are vital that those voters and those communities have voted for, not just against the initiative, but have actually voted for to tax themselves 
over time to pay for things. And I think at some point, you know, we have to make sure that however this comes down, that we recognize that the impacts are dramatic in certain areas more so than in other areas, even while we have to recognize, you know, the message that the voters were sending us. So that's going to be, I think, how I'm viewing it. I know from the standpoint of uh, King County legislators, we met uh, recently, and, um, and there was a lot of discussion of, uh, in that vein, uh, not to say that, um, at least from my standpoint, that, that it's a, a standpoint of punishment. That doesn't, I don't think that's productive, but I do think there needs to be recognition of what voters in these communities have put on the, on, on the books prior to this latest vote of 976 and, and how the cuts to transit, for example, in my, in my community are going to be very, are going to be felt. So Senator Braun, let me ask about both a looming recession and then the state of the rural economy in Washington state. Uh, it doesn't feel like, we don't really have much of a rural policy. It's a composition of policies that have a rural component. Uh, Hearst was sort of this flashpoint of rural policy that uh, was basically a water policy that applied at the, mostly at the rural level. Um, when the next recession comes, I don't think Washington, rural Washington will have yet recovered fully from the last recession. How do we guard against the hollowing out of our rural communities at the legislative level? How do we make sure that we are maintaining those communities, that they're healthy, that they have these transportation infrastructure investments, education investments, while at the same time jobs are moving to urban areas and the next recession is around the corner? That's a complicated question. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, so uh, there's a lot of things going on. I, first of all, I, I broadly, you know, not as, as strong economy as central Puget Sound, but broadly, rural economies are doing much better in the last couple of years. I mean, they didn't recover as, as fast or ultimately as strong, but if you look and compare their performance now to their historical performance, still a market increase, and that's a good thing. Uh, the challenge we have and I go back to, we got to look, look for policies that work for all of Washington. Many rural districts, like my own, a lot, a lot, a lot of southwest Washington, a lot of eastern Washington, northwest Washington, uh, their resource-dependent industries, uh, you know, their ag-dependent industries, all, many, many rely on manufacturing, and these are industries that we have not been super friendly to in the state of Washington. And we have to, I think we have to purposely look for ways to encourage those types of industries in a, in a balanced and environmentally uh, friendly way, of course, but still, if you, if you uh, I used this example this morning, and maybe it's not the best example, but you know, the, the mine shut down in my district about 15 years ago, the, the one power plant's gonna shut down next year. Um, regardless of how you feel about those shutdowns, those are very high paying you know, family wage jobs. Uh, that's an enormous, asset value that, that, that covers a lot of property tax in part of my district that pays for fire and schools and libraries and, and the county and this. So, um, and uh, as much as I'm in favor of more tourism, tourism dollars, service industry is not, are not gonna replace those jobs. We as, as a state have to think about how are we gonna find jobs? And a good example right now is the methanol plant in Kalama, I know that's controversial. Uh, but the, the, there's a strong argument that it's a very environmentally friendly opportunity for our state that would provide very high paying uh, jobs in a rural community. We need to look for those opportunities and keep an open mind, not come to the conclusion uh, until we've seen all the facts, until we've thought through how can we make this fit for all of Washington. And I, I, I firmly uh, believe we can. I, I, the last thing, I, I just kind of come back to the earlier conversation on, on transportation. Transportation is important, certainly for the fu uh, central Puget Sound, and I get it. You know, I go to Seattle, you know, once a year just to make sure I understand. <laughs> the, maybe twice a year. Do you? Yeah, I, I do. I, I, he doesn't believe me, but I do. Um, it's a real problem, and we shouldn't pretend otherwise. It's, you know, you have a different transportation reality uh, than I have in, in Centralia. But the truth is we all need transportation investment. That's important for our economy, it's important for our quality of life, it's important for our environment. 
Um, and I, the way I view 976 in particular, is like it or, or don't like it, this is an opportunity for us to rethink how we're both investing in and funding transportation. I think we ought to take take advantage of that opportunity in a very in, in as bipartisan process as possible to make you know to make to, to chart out a future that's that's better for us in terms of transportation and lots of opportunity there. I think if we just put our heads heads together on that. Representative Wilcox, how do you as as the House Republican leader that whether you like it or not puts you. Uh, on a very short list of the most important Republican leaders in the state, um, particularly absent too many uh, statewide elected officials, though there are two in the Republican Party or from the party. Um, Washington State and the Northwest in general have a, a, a different kind of history in terms of Republicanism, the Dan Evans style of Republican, Slade Gordon style Republican, different than a Mitch McConnell style of Republican and, and the national Republican Party. How do you bridge the two gaps of the differences between the Northwest Republican and the National Republican uh, Party, how do you sort of carve out a space for a unique character here in the Northwest? And as you look to grow the caucus, you gotta get out of, as you know, into the, from rural Washington and into suburban and sometimes, sometimes urban uh, communities. Uh, so how do you try to bridge those two gaps between national and local and rural and urban as you try to grow the House caucus? Okay, first, uh, I'm going to be very cautious because you're asking about elections, and this is a, a legislative uh, uh, event for us and has been organized using, uh, on, on our side, uh, public resources. So I'm not going to talk about any individuals. Um, but first, you know, I don't really see the parties as a brand, and my background to some extent is in uh, brand marketing. I see them uh, more like a trade association. And a trade association is there to do all the things that the individual brands don't want to do. And uh, I really see individual candidates as the brand. And when you're in the minority, and, and uh, you know, we all know that this is a state that uh, leans blue, um, Republicans are not going to be successful in just, uh, across the state anyway, in just base elections. So you can't run in a swing district as the generic Republican because that swing district probably leans against you. So you have to be your own brand. You have to be a unique individual. This is why we try to recruit people that uh, are embedded in the community. If it's generational, that's even better. Uh, they, they have an identity of their own and people are thinking about that person's name more than they're thinking about the letter uh, after their name. And, and I'll be honest, in, in my life, uh, living in the same place, you know, in terms of my family for 110 years, we've never cared what that letter was. We cared about the individual that was running and whether that person was someone that we could trust. And so that's the kind of election that we would try to promote. Uh, and uh, then for myself, I think we're in a place in history right now where um, you cannot you cannot change people's minds quickly. There, there's no magic bullet to make people believe, if, if you're a Republican now, to make people believe that uh, Democrats are great or vice versa. I, I think that we all have to be, and this is why I was talking about trust earlier, we all have to be willing to play an absolutely long game that may not, and I mean this in terms of caucus elections too, that uh, may not uh, bear all the fruit that we want it to in 2020 or 2022, but conduct yourself in such a way that you will overcome people's objections to whatever groups you belong to. And it, I think part of that is, is yourself uh, stay away from categorizing people in unfavorable ways because of what party they belong to or what group they belong to. There is nothing more important in my mind right now than building trust with your fellow human being and uh, the voters. And uh, I, I would sacrifice some other wins at this point uh, in order to build trust in the process, build trust in the House Republicans, and uh, to go back to transportation. I've been telling people for several weeks now, I don't think that was a vote against transit, for example, even though it gets cast that way sometimes. It, it was a vote because people had lost trust. And, Trust right now is way more important than policy wins. I want to make sure that we can get your questions answered. And uh, Rita, we'll have a microphone running around. So if uh, you all have a question, we'll just get your hand up and, and Rita will get you a microphone. 
Uh, Senator Frock, let me ask you this question, uh, because this week you're our national celebrity, meaning you've been in Politico, you've been in New York Times because of this public option legislation that you helped uh, champion in the Senate. Uh, that's, you know, your celebrity star my, may fade My, my, next my week. mother was very proud. Yeah? <laughs> She's the only one who sent me an email about it, so I don't know. <laughs> what, has, uh, what has it been like to get sort of caught up in the national media attention around health care yeah. and all of a sudden the public option is one of the great saviors of the Democratic Party in this election. Tell, tell us what that whirlwind has been like. Well, it's been interesting. I mean, I think we knew that when Representative Cody and I started working on this with Governor Inslee and his team uh, last year, that um, if we could pass this, this would be significant. And what I've said, I see friends from Healthcare for All Washington and other groups who are here today. Um, we did a good job of building a coalition of support. And I think the interesting thing, and then I think maybe the national party should take a look at is, we actually had um, um, in our sort of coalition of support, backers of uh, single payer uh, to more moderates in our caucus to actually deliver something that I think is significant. It's not um, earth shattering in terms of what it does, but there are elements of it that are gonna be very important if we ever get to a, a national conversation or a national solution on, on how we get to a better system of coverage, universal, I hope, for the whole country. Um, and so it's a, a situation where a state is really a laboratory of democracy, uh, you know, as, as the phrase goes, and we are uh, sort of on the cutting edge. And so the lessons we learn politically, um, I think, are instructive. And that's what I think the thrust of those stories um, have been about. I think one thing that they're screwing up at, and then uh, if I could just, I guess that was a pretty blunt statement. One thing I think they're not doing as well as they should at the national level is contrasting the, de the democratic message on health care with what I think is a huge uh, uh, fallibility in the Republican approach that President Trump has put forward, which is he is today seeking to overturn the entire Affordable Care Act. And Democrats were successful in pointing that out, pointing out the pre-existing condition issue, other benefits. The law has, has never been seen as perfect, but it's grown in acceptance over the last 10 years. And, and we have gotten too caught up in the fight between how we get to what we all want, which is universal cost, universal care at lower cost for all people and not focusing on the very bad policies that I think the Trump administration is focused on. So I think that's what the National Party needs to do and our, our experiment here in Washington could be instructive. So Senator Braun, uh, when I have uh, spoken with the, with the governor's office over the last months or handful of years around climate change issues, over time they have started to say things like, uh, we are getting real engagement out of the Republicans, and particularly Senator Braun is very open-minded and really engages in an open-minded discussion on some of these uh, topics. Uh, I don't think that, I think that's a compliment. I hope that's not you thinking me throwing you under Who the bus. Who called me open-minded? Uh, <laughs> 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 what, uh, what do you think of I was, climate, I was gonna say something nice about him, but now I won't say anything if he doesn't want. What do you think of climate policy and environmental policy in general, but climate policy specifically uh, in the 2020 and future legislative sessions. Where is there room for compromise and, and more progress? So I, I'm not sure, um, that's a good question. I'm not sure I know a, a great answer to it. Uh, you know, broadly, I, I have been willing to engage in, in the carbon discussion. I think it's, you know, there's nobody out there, it doesn't matter your politics, that wants more carbon, right? Uh, everybody's okay with less carbon. It's just how do you get there in a way that is not uh, harmful to our economy, regressive, that puts, you know, that comes with second and third order effects that are not good for, for our, our citizens. So um, we've had a lot of discussions. I, I think there's, I, I'm actually very encouraged by just, you know, culturally and societally how we're coming. If you look at the actual numbers, how the state of Washington is doing relative to the British Columbia, Oregon, or Cal California, we're actually beating them all in terms of reducing carbon. And, and we're not doing that because we have a carbon tax or a, a cap and trade or a, a low carbon fuel standard. We're doing it because, you know, just like the same reason we have, you know, non-GMO foods in the, in the grocery, or organic foods in the grocery, because, you know, thousands or, or hundreds of thousands or millions of people are making individual decisions in their lives that are creating less carbon. 
That's an excellent way to solve this problem, and we should acknowledge that. It's not a complete solution, uh, but it go, goes a long way uh, to getting us there. And then, and then knowing that, we should talk about policy that supplements that, that encourages that type of discussion, that brings everybody along and, and doesn't you know, pick winners and losers. Uh, and, and that's not exactly an answer to that, the, the overall problem, but I think if we, we approach it from that standpoint, we will be a lot more successful as a state, and frankly, not because we intend to do more because of you know a political stalemate. That's how we've approached it, and it and it and it's working uh, to a certain yeah. degree. The uh, and and we should acknowledge that. So the you know what happens in the coming session? You know, David promised we were out on time, which means we probably don't get any of these done in the coming session, but it's not gonna go away. This issue is with us for the long term, uh, and I think we do ourselves a service when we, we speak plainly. Uh, we don't exaggerate either the, the potential harm or the lack of harm. We, we speak plainly about what the challenge is and how we can do it, and acknowledge that uh, we have to do it in a way that doesn't, doesn't hurt people. Because if we do it, if we don't do that, it won't be sustainable, it won't get the, the results we're looking for long term, and that's been my approach. Uh, it hasn't led to any, you know, alarming breakthrough, but I think we should keep our minds open. We should recognize that that uh, again, nobody's opposed to less carbon. Yeah. Uh, we should start from there. I know we have a question here, but Representative. So um, let me let me add that I, I thought we had a breakthrough this session. Um, Representative Orcutt and I sponsored a green transportation bill. Uh, that extends our, ex our charging network that provides um, incentives to purchase EVs, whether they're new or used, that provides funding for the electrification of buses, um, and, a, and a few other elements in that. And I, th I think the vote in the House was something on the order of 80 members supporting that. So um, I think things can get done. Um, I, I put that out there because I wanted to have an alternative that wasn't going to be a partisan um, fight. I wanted to see whether we could bring uh, both Republicans and Democrats to move things along in a way that would be productive um, and that could show that, that we could do a climate bill on a bipartisan basis. And I was resistive to have any what I would call mandates stuck in the bill because I wanted to make sure that we could continue with a promise that, that Representative Orcutt and I had, which was that we were gonna push a bill that was gonna make a difference, wasn't gonna be the total answer, but we were gonna give people the opportunity to, on their own to have some incentive to be part of the solution dealing with carbon. Good, right over here, why don't you uh, tell us your name and organization. Stand up, please. Hi, my name's Ray. I'm the founder at Skookum Kids, which is a foster care charity. But I want to ask a question not related to foster care, just as a, call me an overly curious voter. Um, and I'm a total political outsider. Perhaps this is a question that only a, an outsider could get away with. It seems totally nuts to me that we cram all the decision making about a, what is it, $15, $53 billion budget and the fastest growing state economy in the country and um, real people's lives, life and death, these are really important decisions and to cram them into 60 days seems irresponsible. So my question is, would we not get a better quality of decision with a professionalized legislature? And if yes, why haven't we done that yet? Representative Wilcox, you wanna take that one? Oh. <laughs> as the least professional person up here. <laughs> you know, I've thought about that quite a bit, and, and maybe I've come at it from a, a different point of view. You know, what Washington does uh, is try to have people that are firmly um, enmeshed in their districts and in a, another walk of life. There's, there's not very many people that just make a living uh, doing uh, legislating. And I think that means that we're much more realistic. You know, we're in much closer touch with the people that we're supposed to represent. And you know, there might be a little bit of a philosophical difference. I've been talking uh, 
up here for 20 minutes now about how I think that building trust is more important than passing uh, every piece of policy that is desired out there. I, I think the pace of change that uh, people are living with right now is really fast. And uh, in some ways, uh, we would be better if we spent more time explaining change rather than creating more of it. Uh, I also really like the way that uh, having a uh, non-professional legislature, but one that pays enough so that people can get by, means that you have access to anybody, anybody in your district. Uh, as a possible candidate. And one of the things that I've learned in nine years there now is the legislature is amazingly representative. Uh, there is a ton of diversity there. And, and it's uh, diversity uh, across every category that you can imagine. There's lots of people that uh, uh, have been union members. There's lots of people that have been employers. There's uh, people from almost every field that you can imagine. I think that's a really good thing that you would end up losing if uh, it became just an occupation. I want to go to this question here, but does any, uh, do any of the three of you believe, others, uh, you two, Representative Wilcox, I guess, that we should move to an expanded legislative session that we should maybe go year round or have professional uh, salary compensation like a California or New York? I've thought, um, I've thought in the past we should uh, maybe consider doing some kind of extending it a little bit and do like three weeks on, one week off or something like that to, to make the flow. We, it, things do get crammed up there at the end for sure. I think, you know, one thing I would say to the gentleman who asked the question is, you know, it, it, there is a lot that gets done, and it's in, 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 it's certainly at times things don't get done quite right, but I'd say a lot of times things do get done right, which is a testament to there's more cooperation in Olympia. Even when we have big fights, and we do have them from time to time, there's a lot of a lot more cooperation than there is in D.C., and I think the big difference is in D.C., you know, they they kick the can down the road. They do continuing resolutions. I mean, they, they haven't agreed on a budget and I don't know when, and we can't do that here. We have to actually solve our budget. That drives other decisions that have to be made. And uh, so I feel like uh, sort of the, the time pressure in one sense gives us a little bit of a push to get things done. On the other hand, I concede the point that sometimes we don't make every decision as well as it could be made, and maybe we should extend it a little bit. I would have to say that uh, I don't think the solution is a full-time legislature, but I think uh, the legislature needs to be more accommodating to more folks. Um, I often hear, for, particularly from um, women members of the legislature who have to balance a job, taking care of family uh, with, with their legislative duties, and it makes it very difficult, and if, if not impossible, uh, for them to aspire to be members of the legislature. I think it can be, can, can be accommodated, um, maybe by having breaks so that we're not um, uh, in it for 105 days solid where there doesn't seem to be a, a break for, uh, for folks to sort of sit back and, and recover from all the work. Um, but I think we are missing something by not having more people who are, um, ha have the struggle to participate uh, as a legislator, I think we're missing some people who would, I think, be valuable to our, to our deliberations. Question over here. Hi, my name is Heather Valina Weva. I'm the Deputy Director of More Equitable Democracy. And I really appreciate all that you, uh, this conversation about, you know, bridging divides and making our democracy more accessible uh, and systemic changes. So one question I have is, you know, one of the things we can think about is when we think about our electoral systems, what uh, about them is stoking divisions and one of them is, is making us come together. And so I'm curious your thoughts on um, solutions like ranked choice voting and proportional representation. There's currently a bill in the legislature to allow local jurisdiction, jurisdictions to opt in to allow ranked choice voting and other options. And this would has pr been proven to you know, increase voter participation, have uh, more, represent more representative democracies. Um, so I'm really curious um, your thoughts and also uh, do you support that bill? So I'm gonna uh, take this on because I have, uh, from a county that's had direct experience 
uh, Pierce County uh, tried it, and it was a disaster. Um, and we ended up, we spent a whole lot of time trying to remove someone from office who was maybe, at best, a lot of people's fourth or fifth choice. I think it's difficult enough for voters to decide when it comes down to the general election between two people. Um, I appreciate that there may be some benefits uh, from ranked choice, but um, where we've tried it in the state, I thought it, it was not, it didn't lead to the best results. Um, and I just think it's a lot to ask people um, to make second, third, and fourth choices uh, for, for a particular position. I, I, just, I, I just don't see the upside of, of that kind of a process. Anyone else want to speak to that at all? There, like we can move to another question, but if you want to jump in, I'll let you. Well, I, w I would just add, um, and it kind of plays off what both JT said uh, and the last comments, is um, you know, if, if you're trying to build trust with, with the citizens, making the system more complicated is not the best way to do that. Um, uh, we have real challenges here. People live very complicated lives. Uh, the, making it harder to figure out how to vote is not going to help. What I think does help is encouraging more people to vote. And I think we've, we've already seen that uh, in the last couple cycles. We continue to get increase, you know, more and more folks involved in, in, in casting uh, their votes. And I think uh, if you're going to get a more if, if the goal is to get a more representative uh, selection, and I think that's a great goal, then let's, let's, one, keep it simple, and two, encourage more people to be involved in the current system rather than turn the current system on its head. I, I would just say I, I'm open to it. I, uh, I, have, I, wanna, I wanna learn more about what how the system is working in Maine, which I think is the main place that they've done it. Um, they even do it, I think, for congressional, congressional districts there, so that's an interesting situation. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, interested in, in finding out more and understanding how it would work as a practical matter. I, I certainly respecting my colleagues and, and kind of their concerns. Question back here. I'm Josh Kearns. I'm a Spokane County Commissioner. Um, th there's been several studies out there that, um, that show the, the direct impact that land use regulation can have on the cost of affordable housing. Is there any type of appetite or desire to maybe address uh, Growth Management Act reform? Well, um, yeah, you've always seen lots of appetite for that from the minority party where, because, you know, we represent the places that feel like the economy has been damaged and uh, the ability to have affordable housing has been damaged by land use restrictions. And for most of my time in the legislature, it felt like uh, that uh, was cast in concrete or maybe inscribed on a stone and there was great fear on the part of advocates of growth management that if you modified it at all, the whole edifice would crumble. But I think over the last couple of years, there's been a recognition that you can uh, make modifications and the world doesn't end. And I think you've seen some recognition uh, that the problems that are contained in, in the way that we've cast this in concrete uh, are not confined just to rural areas or small towns. It's uh, the biggest cities uh, that uh, have created problems. And so there's, there's more energy, I think, around modifications to that than there's ever been in my time here. But uh, it's also one that still has a lot of advocates on any side feeling like a compromise is a disaster for them. And this is one where, actually it's the kind of issue that I really like in the legislature. It's where uh, lots of sincere people from both sides uh, can agree on something in the middle and muscle it through. Uh, that's, that's us doing our job. Let me, uh, I wanna ask a question back here. It'll be our last audience question, but I wanna tee up our final question, which will be to ask each of you to make one big, bold prediction for 2020, whether it's a session or anything else that might happen over the course of the year. Uh, first, let's go back here for another question. You bet. I'm Randy Smith, a PUD commissioner from Chelan County, and, and we're nonpartisan in our commissions. And I want to ask the question about the last several years, citizens of the state of Washington voted for the top two primary. And how has that impacted what goes on in Olympia, positive or negative, from your views? Who wants to take with that one? 
Has it created more concern about primaries? Has it created more moderation amongst members? Those were the things that were discussed uh, when the top two was rolled out a generation ago now, but it uh, seems like it. Have we seen those concerns or those predictions play out? I, I, it's hard to know exactly, but I, I think it, it, that they have not. I think it's, you know, I think, again, what the voters, in my view, want more than anything is a, a clear understanding of the rules. They want to know how the process works so that they can participate in, in, in vote in a way that they think best fits, fits their needs. We have implemented the top two. I think, you know, the, the, the different the parties have adopted or adapted to it. And I think it's working, I, I think broadly it's working well. Um, and fundamentally it's what the, what the voters asked for. We've delivered it and I don't see, uh, you know, any, any gain and I don't see any negative as a result and therefore uh, we ought to reflect their wishes. Yeah. What I don't think we can translate uh, what happens, seems to happen at the federal level with congressional races where people are very worried about being uh, primaried by someone uh, that is either to the left or the right of the incumbent. Um, my two contested races uh, were against uh, other very good um, Democrats, one of which is going to be Speaker of the House. So, uh, I, and I think the voters um, had more of a choice in that particular case than the races that I've had since, which were against either an income, uh, independent or a Republican challenger, um, where the outcome was going to be well known in advance. All right, so I write this prediction article every year. Uh, predicted that I think Frank Chop might resign, you know. Uh, predicted that we might have a, uh, a woman as uh, the next speaker. Most of that stuff I, I write because I hear it from somebody in the legislature saying something one way or the other. So tell me what I should write when we get to the prediction column for next year. Uh, Representative Wilcox, what's a big, bold prediction, particularly if somebody might not see it coming? Uh, big, bold prediction for 2020. Well, you know, in the minority, um, you're very reluctant to make big, bold predictions because the, the more that you make predictions, the less likely they are to come true. <laughs> so I, I would rather listen to the majority predictions and then say, no, nah, I think we're going to stop that. A <laughs> uh, uh, studied non-answer or declined to answer. <laughs> Senator Braun, have more courage. All right, well, I certainly appreciate uh, JT's approach to that problem. I'll make one, I'll make a bold prediction. I can't say how accurate it'll be, but I, I, I predict that we will, and it goes back to what, something I said earlier, we will use uh, 976 uh, as an accurate reflection of, of concern by the voters, not that we don't need investment in transportation, but that we need to do it in a more thoughtful and balanced way, that we rethink you know, how we fund transportation, our long-term addiction to transportation bonds that's made it hard and maybe possibly impossible in the five to 10 year frame. And we, and we also use that as motivation to, to bring out a, a new transportation package sooner rather than later to address things like the Columbia River Crossing, Highway 18, the trestle, uh, and that we do in a way that hopefully uh, finds either, uh, in my view, uh, existing or at least uh, better uh, revenue sources that uh, the voters can support and be behind long-term transportation inv investment. So that is my bold prediction. That's good and strategic in that the chairman of the House Transportation Committee has to go next, and you don't get to say major transportation financing reform. Well, I would say uh, there may be some steps forward in what Senator Braun has indicated, but it isn't happening in 2020. Uh, I think 2020 is going to be more consumed with how we get to, in transportation, how we get to 2021 and get our transportation infrastructure moving in a very positive fashion. Senator? I predict that, I have two predictions. Do you want to hear them both? You know it I might do. even be three. Great. All right, so the first one is, 
I predict Adam Schiff and Jim Jordan will appear in a remake of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid together. <laughs> I predict that the Democratic no nomination for uh, president will not be decided on the first ballot at the Democratic convention, which will then free up the delegates, as I understand the rules, to sort of vote however they want, I think that's how it works, and that Oprah Winfrey will be nominated by some, somebody <laughs> to be one of the candidates. So that was sort of three. Yet, I had no idea what's gonna happen with transportation, but I thought those would be more interesting. Yet another reason why I would love to have dinner with any of these gentlemen, but I would particularly like to have dinner with this guy. Uh, Gentlemen, thank you very much. Senator David Frock, Representative Jake Fai, uh, Senator John Braun, and Sen uh, not yet Senator, Representative J.T. Wilcox. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, guys.